Warm greetings and welcome to our program, Foreign Dispatches, coming to you from London. I'm Doris Okenwa, and on this show, it's all about people, places, and issues. Today, our gaze is on the forthcoming elections in Nigeria. The clock is ticking faster than ever before, and folks on this end are wound up in anticipation. As you know, Nigerians living abroad are excluded from voting, but they will not be excluded from participating in terms of airing their views. We will bring you some of those views on the program today. But that's not all. We will also introduce you to a prolific African author who talks about corruption through the eyes of children. And then we will finish up on a lighter note with a little something about London streets and shopping. Let's dig in now with a quick rundown of events. We'll start with how Nigerians here have been mobilizing for the elections back home. The UK has seen a wave of activities regarding Nigeria's elections in the past couple of months and counting. Dialogues, rallies, party campaigns, protests and more. Different groups mobilizing either for a political party of choice or simply to put key issues on the front burner. A common thread running through most of the conversations is insecurity and concerns over electoral violence. Even more worrisome to many is the economic downturn occasioned by plummeting oil prices. Some prominent events indexed these issues like the meeting on how to fix Nigeria, the 2015 elections and beyond, convened in January. The gathering pulled an impressive number of Nigerians, Africans and non-Africans alike. Representatives of the two major parties in Nigeria, APC and PDP, were thrown in the ring to defend their game. In February, we saw the book launched by Nigeria's former president, General Olusegun Obasanjo, and as expected, there was more to be said outside the pages of the book. Members of the Royal African Society hadn't gathered around to hear about his childhood, and they were not disappointed. Elections was on everyone's mind. Then there was a whole saga of elections postponement. First was a suggestion at Chatham House by Nigeria's National Security Advisor. Then petitions and protests against such insinuations. But just when we thought things were basically all about party faithfuls and patriotic Nigerians in diaspora lending their voices to free and fair elections, things were stepped up a notch in February with the rumored indisposition of APC's presidential candidate. The coin was flipped for 10 days as UK took center stage. However, at the heart of it all, rallies, protests, debates, lies the cumulative desire of many Nigerians, home and abroad, to see an improved state. There, you get a sense of what Nigerians and even members of the international community are saying and doing about the coming elections in the country. But for a more stimulating discourse, we'll take you now into our chat room we are engaged with an Africa expert on democracy and security. We looked at the changing face of global politics and Nigeria's place within the context of elections and social change. Welcome to our chat corner. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Fumi Olonishakin and she's the founding director of the Africa Leadership Center. Very notable for her works on Africa in Sierra Leone with the United Nations, among other remarkable projects. Dr. Fumi, good to have you with us today. It's Thank you. always great to chat with you. Thanks, Doris. Let's examine the trend of global politics. 2015 is a big political year. Shall we call it the year of the elections? Indeed. What I find interesting is, I don't know if you would agree, but if you look at the, the, the mood across the board, there is some sort of a disenchantment, you know, citizens' disenchantment with the political class. Mm -hmm elusive promises, whether it's water and electricity in Nigeria or healthcare and welfare in, in, in the UK, people seem fed up with promises. What does this say about the quality of politics globally today? Well, I think really uh, the political class have always had a hard time uh, justifying their role uh, to society as a whole. I don't think it's new but the situations are new, uh, the situations have changed. Uh, apart from the global challenges uh, that we have seen over time, we, this particular period is particularly challenging for societies globally. You see the sort of changes that we're seeing in climate, uh, people you know, losing their homes to floods in different parts of the world. You see 
uh, the threat of uh, global terror and local terror because I, I don't think all of the threat uh, you can really uh, ascribe the underpinnings of uh, terror everywhere to the global terror even if it mimics it. Uh, you see situations where uh, the lower classes are getting poorer. You see demographically how the world is changing where you have young populations who actually do not see their place, uh, do not think that they belong uh, to the right place in the social order, in the social political order. It's a big issue in Africa, which is still a, a growing continent. Uh, on the, con the continent of Africa, our population will keep rising till around 2030. Statistically, uh, we know that Africa is about the only continent that is experiencing what is known as a youth bulge now. The average age in Africa is 19, uh, if you like, or perhaps 20. And yet, for this young population, you, they cannot actually identify with the politicians of the times. So really, they reach for a, a, a radical change across the board, which is what brings us to the manifestos. You know, there is this huge uh, debate about um, the manifestos in Nigeria, the political party manifestos or election manifestos mm -hmm. being similar. Mm -hmm. But here we have that same outcry that mm -hmm. you're not seeing anything, anything different, you know. Mm -hmm. Look at one of the, that's the Liberal Democratic Party yes. in the UK, then you have here one of our political parties in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's an aspirational document, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what exactly is is the place of the manifesto in this day and age. Now we're talking about the manifesto in Nigeria at this point in time. I'm not sure the extent to which we have critically looked at this in previous years, except to say that there's an absence of a real agenda. But this time around, parties are putting manifestos on the table. The difference, and I, I know what you're saying about the UK, that sometimes it's very difficult to see the, the uh, a major difference between uh, Labour's program or the Conservatives pro uh, program, and at this time to the Lib Dems as well, uh, because this guys are constantly trying to read society. Uh, you see how the views are almost merging now around immigration. When typically Labour would have stood for something different on immigration, far different from the Conservatives. Now you read society, you read the mood in society, the situations are changing very fast. When you look at Nigeria, it's probably the first time that you would find these parties, or at least the ruling party for example, are trying to actively respond as well because there's real competition at this point in time. The difference to my mind between what we see typically in Nigeria and what we have in the UK, uh, it's not such a fundamental difference, but there's, there's a difference that you have the elite class uh, protecting that, you know, the needs of that class far more than they're responding to what society truly needs. Uh, the difference this time around is that because of that competition, people are having to put forward very concretely a manifesto. Speak to I it. would argue about concretely yes. because um, much as it's aspirational and we yes. don't want to see the, or you don't have to see mm. the ABC, the yes. how. But then if, for instance, you say, like looking at the mood now, corruption yes. is a big deal, right? Yes. Terrorism is a big deal. We're talking yes. about Nigeria now. Yes. When you say you're going to fight corruption by strengthening institutions mm. and s powers of sanction and mm. other, but that, that's that's glaring, right? That that's a glaring mm. factor. That's that's nothing new you're saying, actually. But, but no, 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 not necessarily. I, I think traditionally you see manifestos as something that really is able to let you know, differentiate, see very clearly what the ideological stance of a particular party, political party, is. Uh, and what separates them from the next party. So do you and I say the that? point, uh, well, this is what I've been saying, that we, with the Nigerian elite uh, and the political parties uh, that uh, they hide behind uh, in order to compete for public office, uh, for their own, largely for, the, for that group interest, they don't have to do much about uh, articulating a particular ideology. Uh, they didn't need to do that in the past. And I think now they probably have to think about it more and more because it's becoming more difficult to justify uh, why they exist and why they need to rule uh, to a more 
aware population, a population that is more aware. Yeah, absolutely. We'll continue in just a moment. Don't go away. We'll take a short break and be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. We're still here, and I've been talking to Dr. Fumi Olunishaki. Looking at the trend of the campaigns, yes, it seems to be more character-based, and if you construct like if a, a, a site now on the social media and yes. just look at the trend of conversations, yes. you know, there is still this character driven thing though i would agree with you that people are demanding uh, you're you're talking about <clears throat> parties that are evenly balanced but look at the trend in europe and in the uk that you're beginning to see uh fairly ultra conservative uh right-wing parties that might be saying something different around immigration uh that might be saying something different around integration in communities and it's even more serious in Europe and I think it's a year of some kind of change all round it's not just about those who are leading who are vying for public office it's also about the character of society and what society does about its right to vote the right really the conversation we're having is about state reproduction and the reproduction of society. Thank you so much. Always Thank a you. pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Good to have you.